So this is a perfect segue into players were buy, buying and fading uh, relative to their current average draft position. For me, I'm going to start this off here. I'm going to say Vaughn Grissom. Um, now, you just mentioned about players switching from uh, kind of a less demanding position to a more demanding position. Uh, and that's what we're going to see with Vaughn Grissom as he takes over shortstop for Dan Z. Swanson there with the Braves. The arm strength isn't great for Grissom. I worry defensively about what he could do there at shortstop. And especially during a time we've mentioned this in in the last episode, there's going to be shift restrictions. I I think athleticism in the infield is going to matter a lot this season. So just measuring that as well, I worry about the defensive part. The offensive part, I think there's also questions about Vaughn Grissom. I think he can get on base. I think he can hit for average, but I'm worried about the power. Last season, you look at the max exit velocity for Vaughn Grissom. It was in the 29th percentile. That was kind of surprising to me as I I did my research here for Grissom. Hit five homers, had five steals over 41 games last season uh, with the Braves. Also hit 291, but his XBA expected batting average was 259. So if he can't hit you 20 homers, if he's struggling defensively, if he's not hitting for average, I wonder... If at a certain point the Braves say to themselves, I don't know if he's a regular player on a team that's going for a World Series championship, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point he ends up back in AAA this season. Maybe I'm dead wrong, but I have some concerns, especially for someone whose ADP is where it is, 187.39 on NFC right now. No, I think it's totally valid. I, I was disappointed that it seemed like Dan Sby Swanson wanted to come back and was willing to give the Braves a, a pretty good hometown discount, but the Braves were going to move on and spend the money elsewhere. And now, of course, Swanson is on the Cubs. And um, yep. I, I think he's actually a little bit underrepped. I, I think it's kind of become a little hip to, to knock Dansby Swanson, but I'm still a Swanson guy. We'll get to him in the shortstop preview. But Grissom, I know it's a deep Atlanta lineup. Looks like he's going to bat ninth, so I, yep. I don't like that. Um, yeah. Not a, batting low in a National League lineup is not the kill shot it used to be because they have the DH right. now. It used to be if you hit seventh or eighth in front of the pitcher, that was really bad because that's yeah. where lineups, where rallies go to die. It's not as much of a kill shot anymore. But I think your concerns with Grissom, with the defensive change, with the Braves, the Braves are set up. That they won a title two years ago. They have a roster. They think they're going to be in the playoffs. They're going to be a World Series contender again. They're, Grissom is not going to have a lot of wiggle room if he gets off to a slow start easily could see a demotion or maybe even they, they look into the market in the middle of the year. If Grissom isn't working out, maybe they make a move just for, you know, for a temporary rest of the season thing, a rental, that type of thing. I don't like where he's hitting. I think there's a, I think there's a lot more downside than upside here. I'm not going to be proactively drafting into Grissom, a player I'm fading and I, and I got him wrong last year. I was afraid Tommy Edmond would not keep the leadoff spot in St. Louis. He did. But still, last three years, his OBP is 316. The Cardinals yeah. have all sorts of options. Now, now Edmund's going to keep his spot in the lineup. He's one of several outstanding defenders on the Cardinals, which is why I always love drafting their pitching staff. It didn't save Steven Matz last year, but whatever. Yeah. I mean, they had five gold glovers the previous year. Edmund's glove will keep him in the lineup, and he's not a bad player. But I could easily see him batting seventh, eighth, or ninth at some point. If he gets off to a slow start, there'll be better people who fit that leadoff spot in St. Louis. I, I'm, I'm going to make the same bet. I lost it last year. I also don't think Edmund, you know, if there's more steals this year, he kind of stood out the last few years because he was willing to run in a baseball game where the stolen base was depressed. He's stolen 30 plus bases the last two years, and he's a very high percentage base stealer. So he's merited to go as often as he does. I wonder if maybe that's a little bit less value valuable this year. He's okay at batting average, but just a slight positive there doesn't have the greatest power. If you draft Edmund where he's going, you need him batting first all season. I'm just concerned that he might not. Yep. That was my, my exact concern last season. Uh, I think what helps Edmund from a playing time perspective, his defense is extraordinary. So he's going to stay on the field, but like you said, there's always that volume concern that he ends up lower in the lineup, may not stand out from a speed perspective with uh, what we expect to be an uptick in stolen bases. That's a that's a really good point. Uh, jumping over to players we're buying, uh, number one for me at second base, and actually, uh, spoiler alert, later on I'll say, Jazz Chisholm Jr. is my number one uh, fantasy second baseman this season. Um, and we only got a snapshot of him last year, but what we saw was unbelievable what he put into 60 games last year 
14 home runs, 45 RBIs, 12 steals, 39 runs scored, all over 60 games. I mean, if you project that out over a full season, you are talking about a first round level talent. Bottom line. I mean, an early first rounder, maybe. Uh, of course, had that stress fracture in his back uh, that ended his season. Actually, he didn't play after June 28th last season, which is crazy. Um, had surgery for a torn meniscus as well, but hoping, obviously, that he shows up to spring training 100% going into his age 25 season, February 1st birthday for Jazz Chisholm. Happy birthday, Jazz. Um, but I think even underlying metrics, you look at the numbers he had last year, were, were great. Uh, barrel rate, hard hit rates way up from 2021 among players with at least 150 batted ball events last season. Chisholm was seventh in barrels per plate appearance, just behind Shohei Otani, ahead of Austin Riley, sprint speed 94th percentile. This is someone who can be 30-30 this season. And again, we talked about Vlad Jr. in our first base episode. That ceiling, that ceiling that is so so enticing to chase after. I'm doing that with Jazz Chisholm this year. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of a little disappointed to hear you say that because I was hoping I would be ahead of market on Jazz Chisholm, and maybe I'm just going to be at market. I'm going to have to elbow people out of the way if I want him. But what an exciting player! We, we love power speed combinations. We love players who are still in their 20s who haven't had their best season yet. Not the deepest Miami lineup, but it looks like yeah. Jazz is going to hit third behind a couple of OBP guys in Arias and Segura. So this should be opportunity for him to drive in runs. We'll see how many stolen bases he keeps if he does bat third. But yeah. with a player who has the type of skills that Chisholm has, I would just give him the green light and let him run as much as he wants. So I think that's totally reasonable. The player, my target, if you're going with a vanity second baseman, and look, it's, it's a thin position. I don't think there's anything wrong with attacking this position early. If you go after Jazz Chisholm early, I'm I'm with you. Marcus Simeon, people need to understand the shape of his season last year. Okay, he signs a big contract with Texas, gets off to a horrible start. He had like five hits, it feels like, going into May. But And I realize this is going to be moving the goalposts a little bit. It's arbitrary endpoints. But if you start in the middle of May and rank all the fantasy players the rest of the season, Marcus Simeon was a first-round pick. He was a power source. He was an RBI source. He got settled, new team. You mentioned Texas is throwing a lot of resources into their team. They want to contend. They want to be a player in that very deep American League West. And you have to look at what Simeon did the last, you know, 18 to 20 weeks of the season. It was on a par with what he did his final year in Toronto. He's like a quasi MVP candidate. And I think that poor start, and maybe he was just pressing a little bit, new team, trying to justify the big contract. Some fantasy players think it's a horrible time to buy a player or draft a player after that big contract because of these emotional changes, you know, different different living situation, maybe different school for your kids, that type of stuff. But whatever it was, once Marcus Simeon figured it out last year and got comfortable, he was a first round talent. And his yeah. ADP right now in NFBC is in the mid thirties. I'll take yeah. him in the second round all day. I, I, he, I will have, I've already drafted him in some mock drafts, some magazine drafts. I knew I'll be in on Marcus Simeon this year because even if the market quote unquote corrects or gets a little bit more into Simeon, I, if his ADP is 36 right now, it's only so much higher it can go. I think he's a perfect second round pick. So go, going a bit later in drafts, it's kind of shocking to me to see uh, Brandon Lau, his ADP at 169.47 mm -hmm. on NFC right now. Coming off an injury plagued year, uh, hit 221, 691 OPS, eight home runs, but we know why that happened. He dealt with lower back discomfort, tried to play through it. His back didn't respond to multiple injections, didn't play after September 11th. I mean, that is why he had the poor season. So to me, that's a mulligan. You can kind of forget it, throw it aside. This is someone who had an 870 OPS over 287 games between 2019 and 2021 had 30 home 39 home runs and 149 games in 2021. The max exit velocity last year was still very good, 83rd percentile. To me, I'm throwing out last year and I'm getting myself a value in the middle rounds. Yeah, I like it. it. It might be harder for me to make that pick only because on my most important team we had Lau last year and we just waited and waited and waited for him to come back. And then when he came yep. back, he wasn't productive, but you're, you're so right that when players are hurt, you have to give them mulligans and don't do deep statistical dives to players where it's the simple, it's Occam's razor, right? The simplest right. solution or simplest explanation is so often correct. 
with Brandon Lau, it was that he was hurt. And so, yeah, and yep. the ADP is so low on him. I think that's going to actually correct, and he'll go a round or two earlier Probably. when you get around to drafting. But still, it's a really nice price. Tampa Bay's right so often. One of my later round targets fits that same injury profile. Jonathan India was hurt last year, was horrible in the first half. Now, he did come back and had a pretty good second half. What do we get now? A player still in his 20s, a player in Cincinnati batting second. I'm thinking plus average. I'm thinking he'll hit for some power. He'll steal some bases. I, I can't guarantee you the Reds will be good, but I know you want games in that ballpark because it's one of the probably other than Coors Field, probably the best place to hit in the major leagues. And, you know, India came back and showed what he can do when he was healthy, but his full season stats will keep his ADP depressed. It's a giveaway right now. I'm going to have a, if Jonathan India's price doesn't correct, he's going to be on a bunch of my rosters.